Welcome everybody. We are letting everyone in from the waiting room and we'll start in a few minutes or actually very quickly. I'd like to welcome you to the opening of the expert workshop on NATO and the protection of civilians towards implementation. I'm Victoria Holt. I'm a vice president at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. And I'm very pleased to kick off this day's conference, the first of four days of workshops, which will go through Thursday of this week. Stimson is a policy and research institute looking at the issues of international peace and security. Before I go any further, I'd really like to thank PAX and the government of the Netherlands for the support of this project. I'd also like to thank members of our expert advisory team who have brought their own professional expertise and knowledge to helping us establish the issues that we're going to be looking at today and thinking about how to best support implementation of NATO's POC policy. And I'd also really like to thank our colleagues in NATO, the various offices from ACT and ACO and the Human Security Office in Brussels, as well as many other experts, as well as allies and partners. So first of all, um, about this project, my outstanding colleagues, Marla Keenan, Alex Hopkins, and um, Katie Dock are joining me today. Uh, Marla will finish off today's discussions. If you need anything, both Alex and Katie are with us to help support if you have trouble with linking it through the Zoom. As a moderator, I will also point out that the bios for all of our speakers and the program for the day should be in your Zoom link that you received and you'll receive every day if you need an update. This invitation is for only, uh, it was invitation only events. And we did that on purpose because our goal for this first year is to really kick off an expert discussion and help build a greater community around the work that's being done. So let me briefly sketch uh, a bit more about what we're doing today, the context for it, and then I'll introduce our keynote speakers. We certainly know that civilian protection is important. It's the heart of many of today's modern conflicts. I was really struck that OCHA recently came out, I think it was last week, and said that not only there are 80 million displaced persons around the world, but there's over 250, uh, sorry, 235 million people who are in need as a result of the displacement, but also the pandemic and the economic recession. But they also pointed out the political conflicts are more intense and taking a heavy toll on civilians and that casualties in urban environments from explosive weapons remain still 90% civilians. Everyone also knows that conflicts, modern conflicts have shifted and with the rise of non-state actors and proxy wars uh, in, in disregard for, my, for IHL and human, human rights norms and law, as well as authoritarianism's increase, have all also shifted. So that civilians who often are targeted displays are increasingly so. None of this is news to any of you. None of this is news to anyone who has worked around NATO. NATO has faced protection of civilians issues and uh, understood them both as an implied and an explicit task across many operations. So whether facing threats from ISIS and the Taliban or operating uh, in uh, Kosovo, Balkans, Libya, and many other environments, protection of civilians has been part of what NATO has had to face, not least of all with its first Article 5. We also know that when the Security Council authorizes use of force, it will often direct the missions to protect civilians as well. And that's why we found that the 2016 PUC policy was so pathbreaking. Well, it, it was had a, and does have a great vision and has been followed by very serious efforts to put in place the action plan, a military concept, a handbook, and even exercises and training. So much of this conference is really to focus on what next, how does this fit within the 2030 frame, what do future missions need and demand, and how can the brains and expertise both in, within allies and partners and outside in our community, academic and research world really contribute to that. There's a few strategic things we all know that most nations understand, IHL and human rights law um, and the laws of armed conflict. That is the foundation of protection and is legally required. However, th there is much more that can be built on that. And we've already seen that the lessons learned from Afghanistan. But some of the challenge may well be how do militaries also understand that concept when their goal is now to protect civilians from the harm of others? What capacities are needed? How is this dealt with as a task and at the strategic level? So 
So our project is hoping and planning to do research in this area. You'll see from the conference that we've laid out over the next few days, looking at allies and partners work, case studies on Ukraine and the experience of Germany. Also looking at the ethical policy and strategic goals, how to do better risk assessment and threat assessment, and also what future conflicts and political goals of NATO may be in the context of uh, future conflicts. We are also looking to support uh, the offices as they look towards the future, how to best implement their own action plan and goals as we uh, consider that in the next coming year. So those are the main things I would like to kick off with. Um, let me now turn to introducing our keynote speakers. Very excited to have two eminent ambassadors with us. Ambassador Marriott Sherman is the director of the Stabilization and Humanitarian Aid um, Office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with the Netherlands. She previously served as NATO's Secretary General Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security from 2014 to 2017. The ambassador is a career diplomat who has served in many different countries and regions and a variety of public policy areas, but many of us know her both from her current role and her previous role with NATO. Then we'll turn to Ambassador David Angel, who is the permanent representative to NATO from Canada. Ambassador Angel also served earlier as Assistant Secretary of the Cabinet Foreign and Defense Policy at the Privy Office. He's held many senior positions, including in leading international organizations, human rights and democracy, various posts, but also well-known. And when I first met him, uh, when he served at the United Nations, as the alternative representative on the UN Security Council. Both our speakers have deep professional and personal experience with this set of issues. And I could not be more delighted to welcome them to, to this discussion today. So thank you so much. Um, over to you, Ambassador Sherman. Thank you, Tori. And let me start by saying how delighted I am to be part of this, this eminent group. Um, I'm definitely not the expert. Um, it is an issue, protection of civilians, that's very close to my heart, but I know that all the experts are the ones that actually called in today and are part of this seminar. And I would like to start with thanking all of you for your long um, um, efforts, you know, some, for a long time and your resilience in, in bringing this very important uh, agenda item forward. Um, I think my main point, maybe to start with, you know, of what has been achieved on protection of civilians in the international community, and particularly with NATO, is really to re-emphasize, and everybody of you knows that, a protection of civilians is a core mandate. Um, at the 20th anniversary of um, resolution, UN Security Council resolution 1265 in May uh, last year, the, the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs said, if we're not here to protect people, what are we doing? I think that applies to both governments and also to military. Protection of civilians is the core mandate to protect our own people or the people uh, in the areas where we deployed. Um, but since the adoption of that resolution on protection of civilians in, 99, uh, in 1999, so more than 20 years ago, obviously a lot has been achieved. And I think that resolution was like 1325, another one, which is maybe closely linked to a certain extent, but it was a milestone resolution. I said, basically, I said, but it went back to basics, uh, back to the basics of what we're doing, which is to protect civilians. That's what armies are built for. Um, and today, so that was a paradigm shift to get back to basics in 1999, after a few very horrendous experiences in the Balkans, but also in the Great Lake region. And I think today again, with the impact of COVID, we have this other sort of milestone, groundbreaking situation where we start reflecting and we feel we have to get back to basics. And I think that the whole concept of human security and protection of civilians will help us to get back to basics, to reflect on what we're actually doing and how to enhance our impact, our credibility, but also how to enhance the resilience of the people we're supposed to protect. So the main point for me is really to think through 
what we have achieved, what we have achieved, but also to reflect on what does that mean in the time that we're living in now? How do we have to adapt this concept to make it relevant for uh, the current crisis we're facing, the current security challenges that we face? Um, and to prove the relevance of our institutions, including NATO and the important work it does on protection of civilians. But protection of civilians really is a core mandate. Um, a lot has been achieved since the policy. Uh, obviously, I had the honor to be at the birth of the policy, the protection of civilian policy, but it's in no ways my policy. Many people within NATO before me took up that work uh, and started further to develop it. Uh, I just want to mention too, Dominic Horn, um, but also at the very initial uh, stage before Dominic, we had uh, Justin Sunni, who really did a great lot working with the nations. And this is really a policy by the nations and for the nations, the allies, uh, who really developed this policy. So all the credits go to them. Um, since 2014, the adoption of the policy, a lot has been achieved, but typically maybe for NATO, a lot has been achieved in um, developing tools. So a lot of focus on training and exercises, a lot of focus on practical tools, and a lot has been achieved. We developed a doctrine, um, uh, as I said, many trainings and exercises, trying to mainstream the protection of civilians into the mandate and into the training and exercises. A handbook has been developed. And again, I think NATO is, is a front runner in this, in codifying to a certain extent what protection of civilians means in daily practice. The challenge now really is to see what from policy to practice, paper is patient. So how do we really move from institutionalizing what the focus has been on, institutionalizing protection of civilians into internalizing protection of civilians. And that is a matter of leadership, of partnership, and of accountability. And I think that is really in the current times, that is a critical thing that we have to work on. How do we move from institutionalizing the concept and the doctrine to internalizing protection of civilians as our core mandate? And what does that mean? And so that is, again, as I said, certain sense back to basics. And I think the whole reflection on NATO and NATO is report NATO 2030 allows a great opportunity to make sure that we instill and integrate this protection of civilians in who we are and not only what we do as NATO. Um, back to basics, I think is um, it's very much this internalizing really is, as I said, on who we are and to think for what makes us as an alliance different than other alliances. This touches, protection of civilian touches not only on how effective we are, on our effectiveness, but also on who we are, the basics of values that we protect, international humanitarian law, basic values, fundamental freedoms, but also the basic values of protecting human dignity and equal rights and freedoms. Um, the Dutch military has a beautiful slogan, and it is to protect what we cherish. And that's exactly what protection of civilians is about. It's protecting the people we care for and the values that we stand for. So it's really, I think, if we want to get protection of civilians back to the core of the mandate and to see how it can help us to find solutions to the security challenges that we face today in these very challenging time, not to put it aside as an add-on and a luxury, but to put it back at the core of our strategies and of our mandate and to think through how we can do that best uh, by building on the, diversity, on the diversity of expertise that we have, on our partnership that we have, and a committed leadership that we have and really start to internalize it and to live the values that we're supposed to protect. Um, finally, I would say that the big lessons learned is that that is not only, let's say, to be politically correct, it is also a matter of credibility and it's a matter of resilience. It's credibility of us as an institution, uh, of the credibility of our armed forces. It also helps us to build trust if we do this job right, the protection of civilians, but it's also a matter of resilience, both of the people who we're supposed to protect, as well as the resilience of our own organization. So I think there's a lot to gain to think through what it, if we put protection of civilians at the core of our mandate, 
and put it in the uh, in the security challenges that we face today to see what can this old idea that was not born not even 20 years ago but maybe over 100 years ago um, with the first Hague Peace Conference, I may say, uh, what it can mean in terms of answering as, as an answer to the security challenges that we face today if we put protection back at the core. Because as my minister said, if we're not here to protect people, what are we doing? Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very appreciated. Um, Ambassador Angel, over to you. Um, Tori, thank you, and, and um, thank you for the webinar, and, and thank you for the broader project you're, you're leading. Mariet, thank you for, for opening. Um, I'm delighted to be participating. I'm sorry not to be doing so in person. It would be really nice to be able to interact uh, more directly with, uh, with all of you. Um, let me start by stepping back and, and focusing a little bit on, on the Security Council and, and the genesis of this, because it's relevant to how NATO takes us forward. Um, the, the protection of civilians in armed conflict was introduced by Canada onto the Council's agenda uh, back in 99, as, as Mariette said. Our goal was to address what was at the time uh, two recent and glaring failures on the part of the Security Council. So 99 obviously was five years uh, after Rwanda uh, and only four after Srebrenica. Um, and we, we tried to we tried to leverage the 50th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions as a way of, of trying to place this on the council's agenda. Uh, the Netherlands was serving on the council at the same time. Uh, and as in so many other issues was an absolutely key partner on this. Um, our goal was to equip the Security Council to avoid failures such as Rwanda and Srebrenica in future. Um, we wanted to provide tools uh, that the council could draw upon, uh, but we also wanted to empower council members who wanted to do the right thing by creating decisions and precedents that they could leverage uh, in a crisis. Um, we had three objectives. Uh, one uh, was a very simple humanitarian impulse uh, to better equip the council to avoid atrocities such as Rwanda and Trebrenica in future. A second objective was to make human security uh, more broadly uh, integral to the council's work. And we did this by seeking formally to put POC on the council's agenda as an ongoing part of its work going forward. And for those of you who have been involved in the council, you'll understand the importance of actually getting something formally on the agenda. But once it's there, it's there. And unless it's there, there are a thousand million ways of, of folk can work around the issue. Um, we want to change the paradigm, and, and, and Mariette used almost the same words, so that in the words of our foreign minister at the time, Lloyd Axworthy, um, the ultimate aim of the Council's work is to safeguard the security of the world's people, not just the states in which they live. Um, our third objective uh, was to avert further severe damage to the Security Council's credibility. Um, and, and if you will, to avoid its losing its kind of social license to operate. There's no question that at the time, uh, the council's inaction on Rwanda and Srebrenica uh, had done it enormous reputational harm uh, of a magnitude that it couldn't afford uh, to risk again. Now, the level of ambition uh, that the initiative represented was understood. Uh, we knew that negotiations, especially with China, especially with Russia, uh, would be difficult, and, and they turned out to be. Um, in fact, if you look at the second resolution on protection of civilians, 1296, um, many of the operational paragraphs at the front end uh, were so contentious uh, that we thought we would never actually be able to get through the negotiation of the draft, and so we negotiated the draft backwards. Um, because we had less controversial stuff at the back. And so we built up momentum um, and we allowed exhaustion to set in. And so eventually we were able to crunch the harder stuff because we'd, we'd crunched 80% of the document by the time we got to it by, by working backwards. Um, and if you, if you read uh, 1265 and, and 1296, both of which I led the negotiation on, um, a lot of the phraseology is really awkward. They're, they're not poetry. Um, the paragraph on sovereignty is, is a dog's breakfast, 
um, but it remained unchanged for years and years and years and years afterwards. Uh, just a reflection of, of how difficult it was to, to get agreement on some of these core issues. Um, and our, our strategy was to establish an ongoing cycle of section reports and council responses in the form of presidential statements and, and more to the point resolutions so that the, the, the POC issue would remain before the council and so the progress could be achieved incrementally year by year. We, we knew there was only so much we'd be able to get done in 99, 2000. We wanted to force the council to keep coming back to the issue uh, in the hope that with time, with each year, a little bit more could be achieved. Um, so the presidential statement that was issued in February 99, which was uh, our first council presidency, uh, tasked the secretary general to submit a report containing concrete recommendations to the council um, by the following September on ways the council acting within its sphere of responsibility uh, could improve the physical and legal protection of civilians in situations of armed conflict. And it tasked the, the secretary general um, to consult the interagency standing committee in doing so, um, which is kind of an anodyne phrase, but it actually meant a lot because it meant that it, the SG had to reach out to the programs and agencies, so the UNICEFs and UNHCRs, um, but also to the Red Cross and its different um, guises, but also to civil society because um, the, some of the international NGOs uh, were on the IASC at the time. Um, the SG uh, report with its 40 recommendations uh, was received by the council on September 8th. And on the 17th, the council adopted its first resolution on POC 1265, which Marriott referred to. Um, and that uh, resolution welcomed the report and it put in place a mechanism which I led to review the 40 um, recommendations in detail. And the, the, the council's substantial response uh, then came the following April uh, in the form of a second resolution, uh, 1296, which provided initial substantial responses, but it also tasked a further SG uh, report containing additional recommendations also to be uh, prepared in consultation with the IASC so that this cycle uh, would continue. And, and the cycle has continued. Um, we've had 14 or 15 further SG reports. We've had, I think, seven further Security Council resolutions. Um, we've had a series of major documents. Uh, for example, OCHA's aid memoir in 2002 and issued again in 2016, which sort of set out detailed uh, thoughts on how POC could actually be made real. And also DPO's POC handbook uh, last year. Um, and this notion of a cycle of SG reports and council responses was absolutely crucial, um, not to have them for their own sake, but to create, to lock in opportunities uh, for onward progress. Um, because again, we knew that there was only so much we could agree in, in, in 99, um, but that if the council was forced continually to look at the issues before it through a POC prism, um, that it would, it would make, uh, additional ground each year. Um, an absolutely key thing in my own mind to stress uh, is that the POC initiative was intended to focus on the council itself and on the peace support operations that the council mandated. Um, the initiative was one of two uh, that Foreign Minister Lloyd Axworthy was championing. Um, one was uh, the establishment of the International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty, uh, the final report of which established the, the doctrine and responsibility to protect R2P. Um, R2P was about norms relating to intervention in states where populations were at acute risk. Um, but POC was about something very different. It was a primarily field-based uh, initiative about what could be done uh, by the UN through its peace support operations uh, in, in tangible situations where civilians were at risk. Um, and this in a context where, where peace support operations in very recent memory had, had failed catastrophically uh, to do that. Um, uh, Mariette referred to the 20th anniversary last year of uh, the, 1265. Um, that anniversary provided an occasion for a bit of a stock taking on progress made. Um, and uh, I think many colleagues will have seen the reports uh, prepared by the Secretary General, by OCHA, 
um, by Civic uh, and, and others. Um, some aspects of the assessment were extremely positive. Um, you know, a majority of UN peace support operations uh, today are under explicit POC mandates. There were none at the time. Um, one of the big successes, I think, in 2000 was getting a POC mandate for Sierra Leone for the first time. Um, and then, as Marriott said, we've had um, Security Council presidential statements in 2015 and 2018, uh, which have sort of codified POC as one of the core issues on the Security Council's agenda. And the SG in his report concluded that POC had permeated the situation specific to deliberations and decisions of the Council. Um, I, I can't tell you how far that is from what we thought would be attainable uh, in 1999. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as, as Tori intimated, 20 years on, uh, there was a widespread acknowledgement that civilians remain at absolutely precarious risk. Um, Tori, you said 90% of, of fatalities are, are civilians. In 99, it was 80%. Uh, I know there's room between them, but it, the, 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 uh, the scale of the problem is still enormous. Um, and it's a sobering reality we have to confront in taking the POC initiative forward. Um, but at the same time, um, I, again, this is just my own thinking, we, we really do need to ensure that we're measuring progress in a way that makes sense relative to what the initiative can do. Um, on the occasion of the 20th anniversary, at, at least one NGO, I think more, uh, issued quite angry um, press releases sort of accusing the council of failing to live up to its protection of civilians rhetoric. <clears throat> and one statement listed a number of countries uh, where civilians remained acutely at risk, uh, but many of these were countries such as Libya, Myanmar, Nigeria, Syria, Yemen, where there is no UN peace support operation. And it's, as we consider what's feasible and what's not feasible through POC, um, I think it's really important to remember that the whole project was envisaged around what peace support operations can do. And if you can't deploy a peace support operation, you have another larger different problem. But conflating um, the two sets of issues doesn't help. Um, what we have not seen is another Srebrenica, another situation where peace support operations have stood uselessly by, um, idly by where Civilians are, are, are at risk, and that's and that's a really important outcome. Um, let me um, shift now to NATO and just offer five brief um, observations. Um, the first is that the the NATO policy for the protection of civilians was adopted only in 2016, as, as Marriott said uh, at the Warsaw Summit, to 2014. Um, one can ask why. Uh, the policy was adopted uh, so many years after the UN Security Council um, began its formal engagement on protection of civilians. Um, and the answer, of course, is that NATO's engagement didn't begin then. It, that there were important strands of work uh, underway long before. What the policy did uh, was provide a chapeau and, and pull these strands together. And it's a chapeau not only for the protection of civilians piece, but for human security more broadly. Um, and in this regard, it's, it's an excellent document. Um, we've seen the first iteration of the action plan. Uh, we've seen the first iteration of the policy, then the first iteration of a very good action plan. Uh, we've seen some very strong military documents following it, for example, the concept for the protection of civilians. Uh, and now we're looking towards a refresh uh, of the policy and, and the action plan. Um, my, my second observation is that although NATO's various uh, human security policies uh, take longer to evolve uh, than those of some other organizations, um, there's often good reason for that. And what we end up with in NATO um, are policies that reflect buy-in on the part of the military and so are much more robust uh, than policies uh, that are adopted or organizations where the military is not an integral part. Uh, we're an alliance, we operate on the basis of consensus uh, and having buy-in across now 30 allies, both the civilian parts of government and the military uh, is something very substantial and this, this buy-in matters. Um, 
my, my third observation is that the issue of reputational risk that I spoke of in terms of the Security Council post Rwanda, post Srebrenica um, applies as much potentially to NATO as it does to the Security Council. And Tori and Marla remind us of this in their ACT paper on the implementation of POC policy, observing that in 2007, 2008, widely reported mass civilian casualty incidents in Afghanistan uh, began to affect the perceived legitimacy of NATO operations, especially in the eyes of civilians. And, and NATO can't afford to have its legitimacy and the, the legitimacy of its actions um, be questioned. And so very strong adherence to POC is, is crucial. Um, the fact is no organization that deploys peace support operations can afford to be complacent on POC issues, whether in averting harm through its own actions uh, or in mitigating harm by others, the two, the two pieces of the, the approach that Tori spoke to. Um, the fourth related observation is that a, as a values-based alliance rooted in the rule of law, it's at the very front of the Washington Treaty, uh, NATO has to contribute to the evolution of norms relating to civilians in war. Um, both Tori and Mariette made the point that work in this area is still evolving, norms are evolving, practices evolving, um, but this is so integral to values, to who we are, to what we want to achieve, that NATO's voice simply cannot be absent from this discussion. And a fifth and final observation is that uh, while existing NATO operation and uh, activities are largely in the train and advise realm, if you think of uh, NATO mission Iraq, for example, if you think of um, the training operation uh, RSM in Afghanistan, they're essentially training and advising missions. Um, and so that leads to a tendency to look particularly at POC through a train and assist, train and advise lens. Um, but the fact is, none of us can know when NATO will be back in another uh, combat operation. And so NATO, as it thinks through POC, uh, has to think through the entire um, gamut of uh, elements that might be relevant to what NATO does. Um, so, you know, by way of conclusion, um, with its initial policy and action plan and the military documents that accompany it, uh, NATO's put in place a very strong foundation uh, for its ongoing engagement on POC. But that policy needs to be evergreen. Um, it needs to be at the very heart of the Alliance's work. And I agree with everything Mariette said, it, this isn't an add-on, this is core. And it has to have a focus on implementation, implementation and implementation. Thanks. Thank you Ambassador, very much. Um, I think you have both really captured some of the core, core goals of this conference as the basis for looking forward, that it is core to future missions. Uh, there's an opportunity as NATO thinks about its own future and how this may be a task or a strategic aim of future operations. Um, and Ambassador Angel, if I may, having worked around the Security Council myself, particularly for seven years uh, when I was with the United States government, I think the peace support operation in the world has embraced protection of civilians. So the challenge today and the challenge for uh, coalition operations or future NATO operations is how do you plan for missions where perpetrators may purposely target civilians as part of their political strategy, not in a peace support operations context. Um, it could be Article 5, it, it could be another terrorist attack um, and so in a sense, we're trying to think about how POC moves beyond the, the more traditional peace operations role and how to better assess risks and threat assessments for civilians, whatever the mission set may be. Uh, and then how to help allies and partners understand what that may mean, both at the political level, at the operational level in the field. To your point, Sarah, about this really is what matters in the field. So thank you both so much for teeing this up. Again, our goal is to start with the premise that the work that's been done is extraordinary, it's forward looking, and this is about support to implementation. And so uh, we have found that a unity of effort, we will leave plenty of room to disagree uh, about maybe the strategy and the, the tactics, but the goal is to keep moving forward. So I want to thank you so much. Uh, now I'm going to turn to some colleagues of ours who are within NATO. 
who have been on the forefront of actually working on many of these ideas and, and leading it um, uh, from NATO's Allied Command Transformation. So today we have two colleagues. First, we will turn to Captain um, Papa Giorgio, who is the branch head of NATO Allied Command. Welcome, sir. <laughs> um, no to you. Nice to see you. You, you are strategic partnership branch head, which I understand offers strategic military advice to shape long-term vision and policy on future partnerships and military cooperation with partner nations, uh, et cetera. And before that also were, you were the director of the military planning directorate. And I understand a, a proud um, graduate of the Naval Academy and from Greece with a long maritime history. So very, very glad you could join us today. Um, and then I think you'll be joined um, by uh, Colonel Rachel Grimes, who is the liaison officer now to the UN, ICRC, and NGOs, also at NATO ACT. Um, she has served in the British Army for 28 years uh, and deployed on eight missions. She's also well known to many for her work within the United Nations system, uh, where she also led resolutions on women, peace, and security, and served as a military advisor and deployed with the Military Gender and Child Protection Unit. Um, so, so, so delighted to have you both here. Um, let me turn it over to you first, Captain. Vice President, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, say a good morning uh, or good afternoon to one and all uh, that attend uh, to this uh, workshop. And I would like to thank you uh, for this uh, kind invitation uh, to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, workshop where uh, with uh, my team, uh, uh, we shall uh, try to uh, uh, give you a presentation of what NATO has uh, attained uh, so far in terms of uh, protection of civilians and uh, how these uh, attainments uh, shape uh, the future for NATO in this uh, specific uh, field. Uh, as the ambassadors uh, previously mentioned, uh, in the previous uh, decade, the commitment of uh, NATO and the partner nations to the protection of civilians in the planning and conduct of operations and missions had been underpinned by the development of a diverse body of uh, policies and guidelines. Uh, but uh, allies and uh, the partners have acknowledged the need to bring together uh, such policies, guidelines, and lessons learned under an overarching policy that uh, would address uh, POC in relevant NATO operations, missions, and activities in a more coherent uh, way. Therefore, as uh, it has been mentioned before in the Warsaw Summit in July 2016, NATO heads of state and government endorsed the NATO policy for the POC, which aims to instill a coherent, consistent, and integrated approach to protection of civilians in NATO and NATO-led operations, missions, and any other council mandated activities. In addition to the allies, uh, 26 partner nations associated themselves with the POC policy. NATO's approach to POC is based on uh, legal, moral, and uh, political imperatives and it is also consistent with applicable legal frameworks. NATO and NATO-led operations, missions, and other council mandated activities are conducted in accordance with applicable international law, which may include international human rights law and international humanitarian law as applicable. According to the NATO POC policy, POC, POC includes all feasible efforts taken to avoid, minimize, and mitigate the negative effects that might arise from NATO and NATO-led military operations on the civilian population. Also, when reasonably possible to protect civilians from conflict-related physical violence or threats, therefore by other actors, including through the establishment of a safe and secure environment. The NATO POC policy identifies key areas where a POC perspective should be included, such as in the planning and conduct of operations and missions, training, education, and exercises, lessons learned processes, 
as well as defense and security related capacity building activities across the whole spectrum of, uh, of uh, NATO authorities. To facilitate uh, the implementation of the NATO POC policy, an action plan was developed uh, later on in February 2017. Uh, the action plan based on consolidated political and military advice and uh, the plan itself directs the key actions that must be taken forward to achieve the directed objectives specified within the policy. This plan meets the intent of the policy by influencing training and education, including lessons learned and integrating protection of civilian aspects into the training of local forces, defense and related security capacity building, as I said before, and of course, of course, partnership uh, tools and uh, programs. The current action plan uh, has a three year horizon and it is uh, composed by 13 uh, high level actions or we can call them outcomes uh, that combine together to institutionalize uh, the key tenets of the POC policy. Among the aforementioned uh, 13 outcomes, the action plan called for the development and the implementation of a NATO military POC concept. So on the 20th of June, 2018, the NAC approved the concept for POC. The concept itself provides a framework that when applied enables a consistent and coherent approach to POC within NATO. The concept is meant to be descriptive, not prescriptive. And as such, it describes the broad nature of POC and assists in its integration and the mainstreaming in the planning and conduct of NATO and NATO-led operations, missions, and other council mandated uh, activities. I would like to say that the core element within the NATO POC military concept is the POC framework. This POC framework is mainly comprised of four sections. The first one is about understanding the human environment. And it is focused on population-centric information of the crisis area, guided by the perspective of the other POC sections. The second one is mitigate harm, which is focused on belligerence. The third one is facilitate access to basic needs, which is focused on civilians including the civil society and aid workers. The fourth one is to contribute to a safe and secure environment, which is focused on elements of uh, local government and uh, other institutions. Now I will come to another outcome uh, of, from the POC action plan uh, that was the integration of uh, POC into training offered by NATO and uh, developed training objectives. Based on that, NATO developed tailored training on POC, both for NATO and United Nations officers. And the first uh, pilot uh, training uh, was uh, conducted in Finland uh, in October 2018, almost uh, two years before, coordinated uh, by ACT and FinCENT, uh, the Finnish Defense Forces International Center. This pilot course included the research results on POC training delivered by NATO nations and other organizations like the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations and uh, the ICRC among others. During 2019, FinCEN has organized the approaches to POC in NATO and UN peace operations course. Unfortunately, this year, due to uh, the COVID-19 implications, the center uh, uh, has canceled both the two courses that have been scheduled uh, for uh, the current year. Meanwhile, uh, our headquarters, HQSAT, in collaboration with uh, uh, C2 Technologies, this is a technical company based in Newport News here in Virginia, developed and delivered uh, by the end of 2019, two immersive training tools for uh, protection of civilians 
and children and armed conflict, respectively. These innovative training tools demonstrate how training could be for the 21st century. Again, due to the COVID-19, as you can understand, uh, the uh, rollout uh, plan that uh, we had uh, scheduled uh, for both uh, the new immersive training tools uh, was suspended. When conditions will be suitable in the next year, strategic uh, commands under the coordination of IMS and IS intend to implement uh, the rollout plan for uh, these uh, two innovative uh, uh, training tools. Still, for your information, uh, the Children and Armed Conflict uh, new course has already been included in the NATO e-learning uh, platform, namely the uh, Joint Advanced Distributed uh, Learning. Protection of civilians has also been added into SACER's annual guidance and on education training exercises and evaluation uh, since uh, 2019. For the previous uh, years, POC has not been a NATO exercise objective and only limited POC injects uh, were first added to the exercise Trident Junction 2018. Even though NATO military authorities have monitored how POC was exercised and looked for gaps and opportunities uh, through uh, the exercises. As a milestone on the opera, 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 operationalization, excuse me, on POC, uh, we should consider the integration of uh, POC into exercise Steadfast Jupiter Jackal 2020 that uh, was concluded uh, last week uh, as an exercise objective for the first time ever. Sadly, uh, the cancellation of uh, the exercise academics and uh, the uh, final decision to execute uh, the exercise as battle staff exercise uh, this year uh, limited uh, to an extent uh, the POC education and the development and the implementation of uh, the POC injects. Yet, uh, I have to say that uh, we believe we took uh, the critical uh, first step uh, to, to, to this uh, path. Also in May 2020, uh, NATO ACO uh, issued the, the POC handbook. The aim of the handbook uh, is building a strong POC mindset that integrates uh, the NATO policy for uh, protection of civilians and the military committee concept for uh, POC in the planning and conduct of alliance operations. Uh, I will only make a reference to the objectives of the handbook handbook, which are first to support the development of a POC mindset as directed by Shakur and the understanding of its impact on mission planning and execution. B, support the application and implementation of the POC policy and of the military committee concept for the POC in the planning and execution of NATO and NATO-led operations and missions and all the other NAC mandated activities. The third objective is to provide information in order to develop uh, the collective knowledge on how to use and incorporate the existing POC concept, doctrine, tools, processes into the planning and execution of NATO operations and missions. And uh, finally, the, this handbook, it is designed to be used by all staff elements and execution of NATO operations across different uh, functional areas within strategic, operational, and tactical level headquarters in uh, NATO. Furthermore, uh, this year, 2020, uh, NATO revised two of uh, uh, the Allied uh, joint uh, doctrines. The one for the military contribution to stabilization and the second for uh, joint operations. Under this revision, uh, NATO has included POC as one of the various uh, cross-cutting uh, themes uh, that affect civilians during military operations. And uh, 
being related to the military contribution or to stabilization. At this point, uh, I conclude my part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, briefing uh, to you, and I would like to hand over the floor over to my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Rachel uh, Grimes. Uh, Rachel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Panos. Um, good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank the Stimson Center for organizing today, for inviting NATO, Sorry, I'm just getting my timer going so that I don't run over because I'm really tempted to do that. Um, but yes, I'd like to thank Simpson Center for the invitation to participate, um, for inviting NATO, and for their commitment to increasing the understanding on protection of civilians. And um, for clarity, um, I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel, and sadly my role in the UN wasn't as a lead on uh, resolutions, I wish it had been, but um, really my role in the UN was to scratch my head and to see how can the military implement UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security, children and armed conflict um, into the military execution of operations. So if we think about this morning, I feel like we've had the strategic level from the two ambassadors who have been trying to work out how we can get the Security Council or um, from a NATO perspective, the NAC to be more focused on POC. And then we've got the bridge with Panos talking about what NATO is doing at the moment. And I suppose that I'm going to offer up a, a slightly more tactical approach by looking at the language and the structure of protection of civilians. And um, through this scrutiny, I hope to explain what the future of protection of civilians could look like and also what the challenges are um, at the moment. So if we look at the language around protection of civilians, um, what we can do is we can identify other cross-cutting topics that have their own UN Security Council resolutions, which all relate to the protection of the individual affected by conflict. Um, so I'm thinking about things such as children in armed conflict and the six grave violations, so resolution um, 1612 and 1261, and of course, uh, the women, peace and security domain. Um, so as Panos has outlined, there are um, various layers, four layers to NATO's protection of civilians framework. And what I'm going to do is look through each of these layers and explain mm -hmm. to you what the military is doing to implement those different layers of the policy. So when we say that we're talking about the understanding of the human environment, that means that we are trying to get a lot of information into our intelligence branch. That, it, that information can come from all different assets. It can come from people, personnel on the ground, from talking to the local community, but it can also come from um, more secretive um, ways of getting information, drones, etc. So to understand the human environment, it doesn't actually fall within a protection of civilians advisors role. It falls within, um, it's falls within the intelligence J2 branch, and then it's their job to collate all the different areas of inf information and provide intelligence for the planning staff in the headquarters. And when we talk about the second layer, which is mitigate harm, um, it tends to be focused on NATO um, minimizing collateral damage when it has to attack an opponent. Now, this could be an aerial weapon or it could link to the rules of engagement that personnel, usually soldiers on the ground must adhere to. And, and these are shaped by our observation of international humanitarian law. And they're the product of discussion, mainly between um, the legal officers working for NATO and the targeteer sections, the people that are looking at strike action. And the targeting cell will spend several hours before deciding if it will strike a target and it will constantly re constantly refer back to rules of engagement, as well as giving consideration of second order effects and collateral damage. And I know from when I was participating in the PACS workshop a few weeks ago, there was a lot of discussion about how we could be better at this. And of course, we can be. Any military can improve its game on when it's working in this area. But I will say, hand on heart, from my operational experience in Afghanistan, that um, when we're looking at a deliberate or even a dynamic strike on a target, there is a lot of preparation and time spent and any casualty is, is, um, is a tragedy. But 
we are looking at it. We are giving several hours of, um, of discussion about whether we should or shouldn't be engaging in, in this target. But this area then is actually led by um, our targeters and by people in the headquarters that are, are thinking out of, of what we should be doing to strike a target. The third layer, facilitate access to basic needs. And this is where tr NATO tries to ensure that international organizations and non-governmental organizations can operate safely in, in the area of operations. And also if necessary, and only in extremists, if NATO can contribute to the provision of basic needs. So who does that in NATO? Well, from a military headquarters position, it's our J3, which is our current operations cell, and it's also our civil, civil military cooperation branch, also known as J9. The final layer to our policy on protection of civilians is where is NATO's force used to contribute to a safe and secure environment? And as explained by um, Panos, this is where we're looking at how we can enhance and improve the host nation and its institutions. We're looking at enabling the IOs and NGOs to carry out their work, but really NATO is seeking to support the host nation through capacity building, mentoring and training and assist missions. And this work is led by the headquarters. Now in ISAF, it was conducted by the J10, which was a new J function, a new joint function, and that was called security sector reform. But more traditionally, it's been conducted by the long-term planning cell, which is J5. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give you a test at the end of this, but what I'm trying to do is bring out all the different elements of a NATO headquarters who all have to contribute to a protection of civilians. So I've said here, why am I going into such detail? Well, I hope to demonstrate that when we talk about protection of civilians, we can't pinpoint one person in one branch of either a NATO headquarters or a nation's military, because it's a whole of NATO responsibility. And I think that this week it would be great if we could consider how this structure can be challenged, um, especially for those who are external to NATO to understand who is it that you need to talk to when you say we need to be better at protecting civilians. So I've also not talked about a few other key individuals in a NATO headquarters staff who are absolutely part of the contribution mm -hmm. to protecting civilians. And this is the NATO military gender advisor, and they are mandated to increase the participation of women, prevent conflict and protect women, men and girls and boys from conflict related sexual violence. So that's a huge aspect of the POC policy. And I haven't mentioned child protection advisors. Again, we had one of those in Afghanistan, and that they were leading on ensuring that NATO monitors and reports and where possible prevents the sixth grade violations against girls and boys. So these are two staff appointments with a large protection aspect in their role. And NATO has substantial policy and training in the areas of women, peace and security and children and armed conflict. And several of its member states have staff offices dedicated to leading on these areas in their own national headquarters. The United Kingdom has a human security advisor and that was my old job before I left the military and came to NATO. And I was responsible for ensuring that the Chief of Defence's directives, which is a long document which prepares the force before it deploys into a country. So my job was to make sure that this Chief of Defence's directive had Security Council resolutions relating to women, peace and security, children and armed conflict and human trafficking mainstreamed throughout the whole document. You can't just give this job to some one person, it needs to be given across and mainstreamed through the headquarters. And so the idea was that when it was written and mainstreamed into the Chief of Defence's directive, and um, when it reached our operational headquarters, the permanent joint headquarters, it would be translated into operational plans and eventually end up as tactical orders to soldiers deployed on the ground. So I think what I've proved this morning is that it's pretty challenging to find one individual working on POC but you will find that there are numerous people working on implementing Security Council resolutions, which are related to the protection of individuals. Sadly, I'm unable to guarantee how well they are being implemented. And I think this goes a little bit to what Ambassador Marianne Schumet mentioned when she said, 
it's not just about institutionalizing it. Um, sorry, it's not just about implementing it. I'm just going to make sure I've got my 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 uh, quote correct. She said it's about not just implementing it, but institutionalizing it into ourselves. So I can't guarantee that that happens. And I think that most of us involved in this talk this week will understand that it's quite difficult and challenging to find who, how to hold an individual accountable for this area other than the commander. And I, I can talk a little bit about that maybe in questions and answers. But I think that even if we're not using the exact precise language of protection of civilians, I'm really confident that we're looking at different aspects of those individuals who are disproportionately impacted by conflict are considered in our planning action. Um, I haven't mentioned the casualty tracking cell that was developed in Afghanistan, but that's another example of NATO responding to a situation on the ground and contributing to the understanding of how NATO can better protect, hum um, protect civilians. Well, although NATO doesn't yet have its own definition on human security, I think that this is one area where we can look at all the different UN Security Council resolutions, which are in some way or other linked to protection of civilians. Also, we don't yet have a NATO discipline on human security. However, there is a human security unit in headquarters Brussels, and this covers different cross-cutting um, subjects on women, peace and security, children in armed conflict, protection of civilians, cultural property protection and sexual exploitation and abuse. And possibly this headquarters model could be a model for how different teams who are working on the cross-cutting topics that seek to protect civilians could be brought together in one team, thus making it easier for us to be held more accountable. And it's something that I'm sure we can discuss in the, the week ahead. But it's going to be a big ask to ask NATO or member states to reconfigure their headquarters. And it's not something that could happen quickly or overnight. But certainly I think that the headquarters NATO Human Security Unit is a great example of NATO seeking to bring disparate members who are working to the same goal together. Another example of best practice that supports protection of civilians work which also comes out of the NATO headquarters in, in um, Brussels is the engagement with civil society. This enables non-traditional security actors such as NGOs representing the rights of women and the protection of girls and boys mm -hmm. to meet with NATO staff officers and raise their concerns and make suggestions on how NATO can better protect civilians. I know that my predecessor, Tracy Cheesley and Anna Antonia Cayen, whenever they've been working on children in armed conflict or protection of civilians immersive training or the, the JDL, the um, Joint Assist Assisted Distributed Learning that NATO runs online, whenever they've discovered, uh, sorry, whenever they've been planning this or designing it, they've reached out to members of the UN, the ICRC and NGOs such as Save the Children and Civic. In future, we'll also reach out to PACS and of course to the Simpson Centre. So this interaction with IOs, NGOs and academic think tanks, it's absolutely vital to NATO because it reinforces the message that security of an individual might not be the collective security that NATO is focusing on. So I'd like to conclude then by saying that protection of civilians is the objective of all NATO missions, but the term of POC, Protection of Civilians Advisor, is not established. There isn't one branch dedicated to this work, but almost all of the different military functions have the ability to support the protection of civilians. There are individual staff office, such as the, uh, the GENAD and the Child Protection Advisor, who provide the commander and the headquarters with advice on how to consider those disproportionately impacted by conflict, particularly looking at the 1325 and 1261. And that it's the interaction that with time, these topics will become mainstreamed across the entire headquarters structure and become an everyday feature of our staff work and not just something that people tend to think is just a J9 civil military cooperation work. I'm confident that the policy and the training, especially regarding WPS, Children in Armed Conflict and Protection of Civilians, is well developed and it is well known. The challenge for any organisation is to influence the implementation of these policies and guidelines. Um, and I think that that's something that we can talk about in the next week. 
And before we go into questions and answers, I'd just like to introduce you to the rest of the ACT team who are working on these topics. So we've got Lieutenant Colonel Vito Gomez, who is the lead officer on the comprehensive approach. Anna Antonia Kayan of the two civilian consultants who I jokingly call Icanopedia because they have an encyclopedic knowledge of CAC and POC areas. I think we've also got the ACT gender advisor with us here today, which is great. And I'd also like to acknowledge the, the presence of Dominic Horn from the Human Security Unit in NATO headquarters and Mariana Tunuti from the Allied Command Operations J9, both of whom are absolutely the subject matter experts in this field. So thank you very much for your time and I'm looking forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much to both of you for laying that out. It's a very helpful sketch of the framework of the PUC policy. Uh, and also where it's going. Um, and also, Rachel, thank you for reminding us of the complexity of many of the other areas and offices that also deal with the POC. I'm gonna kick off with the first question, but I see our chat box is growing. Um, so we'll try and keep track of that. Um, and so, and I see that both of our ambassadors have also stayed with us. So if, if they are available for the, the Q and A, we'd be, be grateful if they're able to stay, if not, no problem. So my question just might be, um, when you have a mandate from the council, Security Council, it goes uh, to NATO and it says protect civilians. The broad question is, how does NATO know how to read that directly? That would be one question. Um, and then second, congratulations on having PUC worked into the joint doctrine for stabilization and joint operations. And I'm curious if it's the UAE, if it's the understanding of the human environment where threat assessments of potential harm to civilians from the actions of others is housed. Uh, in other words, if you're setting up a new mission uh, or you're even training a security sector reform, how do you help understand what the threats to civilians are, whether they're low level or more strategic? What part, where do you place that in, in that framework? So I'm gonna let you think about that for a minute and I'm gonna go next to, I think we've got first up, uh, Larry Lewis, if Larry is with us. I am here. Would you like me to, to ask it? And we would love you to ask it. Thanks. Over to you. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> also having worked on Afghanistan a lot, um, there is much to be commended in the effort in Afghanistan. And honestly, I was feeling pretty optimistic after that. Um, but, you know, the U.S. has done a number of assessments uh, for operations since then, uh, the, the counter ISIS uh, coalition operations in Iraq and Syria is one, uh, Operation uh, Resolute Support. And, and so what we've seen in the assessments is that's a, a number of the best practices that were established in Afghanistan have not been carried over into these other operations. And, and, and you have different kinds of problems seen in one than the other. So uh, overall, it looks like we have, you know, we, we've been very effective in adapting within the context of Af Afghanistan where a commander says, look, what do you not understand? Stop killing civilians. But it seems like we've been less effective in the institutional learning uh, and imparting those best practices over to new operations. And so, while I'm really happy to hear that there's new training, um, I also honestly feel like we need more. So uh, what, what other kinds of things uh, do you think would help um, address that seemingly weak institutional learning that we, that we have in practice? Ter terrific. I'm gonna let one more person ask a question and then we'll turn to the speakers and you can pick and choose amongst them which one you, you most wish to address. So I next have Sarah Petrin. Thank you, Tori. Yes, I'm with the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute over uh, at the Army War College. And I was struck by Rachel Grimes' comment about preparing commanders for leadership of missions and um, incorporating aspects of uh, POC mandates into the um, work at the leadership level. And I'm very interested in your and other uh, other suggestions about how to do this. 
And just one question is whether or not the NATO mission should have a POC strategy in the same way that uh, the UN peacekeeping missions are uh, now required to have such a strategy. Thank you so much. All right. Do I have a volunteer to go first from our panel? I don't mind volunteering for the question on understanding the environment. I feel that because I'm in ACT, I can't respond to how does NATO know to respond when a Security Council resolution comes in. Is that OK, Tori? That is fine. Thank you. Uh, OK, so the, the, the question was, um, is it the understand the environment and where you look at where are the threats to civilians identified? Um, and where is it placed? So yes, it is It is placed within what the military call the J2, so the intelligence branch, but it's not just them that will be finding out. It's a whole cycle of different people that will feed the information. NATO at the moment doesn't necessarily call it um, monitor and report, but definitely NATO personnel are monitoring and reporting what they see on the ground and they feed that back in. And also there'll be other work in the headquarters. Normally there'll be um, a, a working group that would be looking on, uh, looking at interacting with NGOs and IOs. I'm, I'm speaking from my experience in Afghanistan and unfortunately, although we had surers, I can't, I couldn't exactly describe that as a civil society meeting, but we did meet with people from the local population. NATO would sit down and ask for ideas from the local community and from IOs and NGOs. And then we would feed this back into this, this intelligence branch that would have to then start to uh, map out where they thought areas of concern would be. So I, I think, I hope that that's answering the, the question on understand the environment. It's not just one team, it's a whole, it's a whole approach to get this information into the headquarters planning psyche. Over. Thanks very much. Um, Captain, I don't know if you would like to take any of the questions and then also Ambassador Angel, if you had a moment, I welcome your thoughts on this. Uh, yes, Glory, from, <clears throat> excuse me, from my side, uh, uh, I heard uh, the questions and uh, what I could say is uh, what I uh, make uh, a reference previously that uh, I consider as a milestone that uh, we are uh, entered uh, the protection of civilians as an ex exercise objective mm -hmm. for the very first time uh, this year. Um, I think uh, from my uh, previous uh, military experience that uh, uh, we should exercise the protection of civilians as, let me call it a mainstream exercise objective for a while in order to understand how this could be integrated, but also to, to understand the osmosis with uh, the rest of the uh, uh, traditional uh, exercise objectives, which are related, of course, everybody can understand that uh, with uh, the mission that we have, uh, with uh, the aim of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the operation that we are exercising, of course, and uh, uh, that will uh, uh, give us uh, the pathway ahead in the future uh, to uh, see how more effectively we shall finally uh, have uh, the protection of civilians uh, theme. But uh, please, uh, we shouldn't also forget the rest of uh, uh, the themes. That's why we call it cross-cutting because they are interrelated uh, under uh, this uh, human security umbrella term. Uh, so uh, just uh, to wrap up, we, we need some time now in uh, NATO uh, to exercise uh, uh, in uh, big exercises uh, these uh, uh, topics in order to better understand how uh, the military can contribute uh, to uh, the human security topics. Uh, I would like to, to mention here that uh, we also uh, have a plan for experimentation of military contribution to human security uh, for uh, 2021. Uh, and we hope uh, that um, uh, COVID uh, will allow us uh, to uh, go along our uh, plans. Uh, that's from my side, uh, Tori. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I don't know if Ambassador Angel or Ambassador Schumann are still with us and had any thoughts. Uh, yes, please, David. 
I can jump into it. I mean, first of all, just to agree with what Panas just said about the importance of exercising. Um, th this is in relation to Larry's question, but also the importance of absolutely rigorous lessons learned. Um, because you know, the reality is that commanders won't have that much chance to interact amongst themselves. You need to find some way of learning the lessons, documenting the lessons, and making sure that they're available um, to folk who are taking forward similar mandates. Um, this is part of what, what Marianne and I were both referring to in terms of mainstreaming as well, though. Um, you know, as long as human security um, themes are, are thought to be the preserve of a dedicated unit, um, you're going to have trouble because what you need is the ops folk and the, the political affairs and security folk, uh, everybody feeling that POC and WPS, the whole package of issues belong to them as much as to a specialized unit because they have to integrate it in the work that they're doing day to day as, as they mount the missions and make them work. Um, uh, on Sarah's question about um, NATO having POC strategies, I think as the UN does, I would guess the answer probably is yes, when NATO is designing combat operations. In, in most of the training operations, the train and advise operations, the POC is there as part of what's being trained. I'm thinking of uh, NATO Mission Iraq, for example, but it's, it's there as part of the curriculum, not as part of the DNA of the mission. But for a, for a combat operation, uh, I really would hope that, um, that it would be baked in um, but I also have to tell you that, you know, as, as, as the ambassador, I sit on the council and what happens in Mons and what the military folk are doing is a bit of a black box. And, and one thing we have to find a way of doing is making it less of a black box each for the other. Um, because the detailed questions about how the military turns this into part of the operations, we, 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 we look at it at 35,000 feet and we see what's working and we hear briefings from the commanders in which this is a part or not, um, but how it's actually designed, I might as well be the continent away as, as being, you know, whatever distance I am from most. It's just, they're, they're, we don't have the habit of interaction yet and we should. Yes, Rachel, go ahead. Um, um, so just checking for the right. I, but I, I think following on from that, um, what I talked about from my, my career when I was in the United Kingdom's military. It has to go from NATO to your member state, to your ally, and then it, it most countries will have something equivalent to the Chief of Defence Staff's directive, this, this document that gives the overarching, um, the legal ramifications and the overarching plan of what the Chief of Defence Staff from the military wants to do. And then really what, the what I think going back to Sarah's point is, it's how do you get that baked into the rest of the, the operational staff work which follows. And I think that you need to have an individual in the headquarters, and an example is that the UK has this human security advisor role. Um, you need to have somebody that can that, that is able, that has a superpower of translating strategic language into tactical military outcomes and activities. So I, I, I don't know how we're going to find these superpower people, but that is what we're looking for. We're looking for individuals, maybe from the J9 civil military environment, but possibly not. It's dangerous to keep choosing people just from that J9 area when we want it to be baked across the entire headquarters. And just one more example to Sarah's question about commanders. I think that Sweden is possibly a good example to look at um, in that... They use mentors to work with all of their key commanders and, and a mentor would go or a coach rather would go and sit with their supreme commander and other senior officers and try to get them to think about not just women, peace and security, but the civilian picture in a military operation. So by having those coaches working with senior officers, it might get senior officers in future in other nations to start thinking about women, peace and security, children and armed conflict, and how they all contribute to protection of civilians. I think Larry Lewis's question is very challenging, um, but I also think that you're not comparing exactly the same US, sorry, the same NATO missions. So the, the missions in Syria and, and, and Libya, I we, we didn't have NATO troops on the ground. 
yes, of course, we, I talked quite extensively about the importance of targeting and I'll reinforce that I feel that that's one area that NATO spends a lot of time focusing on and trying to get right, although in urban warfare, it's very difficult. But really what this, what this week would be very good for me and for my team, for the team that I'm in, is to not just focus on collateral damage and dropping bombs in the wrong places, um, which is wrong and we need to get better at improving our techniques, but we also need to spend way more time at looking at how individual military on the ground can better protect the civilians around them from things such as sexual related violence, sexual conflict related sexual violence or the, the sixth grade violations against children. Over. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I see Tony Iken, who's also with NATO. And then I've got two quick questions because we'll be pressed for time. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Marco and then Mitro. So Tony, did you have a quick comment? I think you're on mute. There you go. Uh, Tony, I think you're off mute, but we're having trouble hearing you. Um, Go ahead. Oh dear. All right, we'll tell you what, maybe I'll come right back to you, see if you can get your mic to work. Uh, Marco, I think you had a question. Yes, uh, good morning, Victoria. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present my question. The, um, the first one is regarding training. Uh, so with uh, NATO's uh, gender, by Strategic Directive 46-1, which I now believe is at dash two, it was almost revolutionary in the fact that it literally told nations, you need to train this in your pre-deployment training or at least in theatre, uh, which was great. And I think it was very successful in, in, in putting the subject at the centre of their attention. What initiative uh, does the panel think that NATO could undertake to try and uh, replicate that success with POC? Is there any hope that a future directive might be uh, so directive as, as opposed to being perhaps descriptive and kind of forcing the nations to, well, I understand that national training is obviously a national responsibility, kind of putting them uh, in, in a corner to make them integrate this into their training. Is there any hope we can do something similar to that? Also, because I think it kind of talks to some of the risk that Rachel was mentioning, it would allow NATO uh, militaries to be better prepared for the complexities that they'd be facing in today's modern, um, modern conflicts. And at the risk of getting my hand slapped, I just want to slightly go off tangent by uh, addressing one of the other things that Rachel mentioned. I firmly believe uh, that leaving the responsibility of, or much of the responsibility of implementing POC within the J9 function as I think Rachel kind of touched upon, does come with significant risk because it is such an operations focused topic. If there's some way that NATO could disperse the weight of this and make sure that the more operations focused functions, the two, the three and the five are more invested in this, I think the success of it being operationalized is much higher. Thanks for that. All right. I think that was both a comprehensive question and I've noticed the clock. So um, apologies to the many good questions in the chat. I'm gonna give our panelists one last comment and a quick lightning round and then hand it to Marla to close us out. Um, Rachel Panos, would one of you wanna jump in on that one? Poor Ambassador Angel. Uh, sorry, to respond to Marco? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, just to say Marco, that's great that we're sort of aligned and definitely something that uh, the team, Vito, Anna and Tony and I are working on is looking at how we can in get uh, some training that would be for everybody in the headquarters from J1 to J9, um, but to look at different aspects of what we are calling human security, but obviously we need to get a definition from NATO on that. But yeah, I think 2021 is our focus is going to be let's try and focus now on mainstreaming it. And maybe it will be an online course to start with uh, and then working with the NATO school in Oberammergau and then hopefully working with member states to start to get it integrated into their staff training more broadly and, and take it away from just the J9, over. All right, thank you. Uh, Captain, over to you and any last remarks and then I'll turn to Ambassador Angel. 
Thank you very much, uh, Tori. Just a very uh, quick uh, last uh, comment. Uh, I have to say again uh, that uh, we really believe that the new training tools that uh, bring us uh, to uh, a, a new culture of uh, training uh, as they are new environments, immersive environments, uh, they will give to everybody that they will find themselves um, uh, in the field uh, much more prepared and much more, with much more knowledge on uh, the cross-cutting uh, 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 topics of human security. Here we are talking about protection of civilian. Uh, the second one, uh, please, we mentioned that, that uh, we have already since last May a new ACO from SAPE handbook. Um, let's see how this will how this will work and how we can uh, use it as a good uh, uh, practice uh, tool in order to have better results again in the field. Thank you very much again for the opportunity and for the very interesting uh, discussions that we already have and we continue to have the next uh, days. Thank you very much, Tori. Thank you very much, Captain, for sharing so many of your insights and I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, Ambassador Angel, any final thoughts? And then I will turn to Marla Keenan, and my colleague. Um, ju just the, you know, Marco's question reiterates in my own mind or reaffirms in my own mind the importance of just what you said at the beginning, Tori, constantly making clear that POC really matters to the council. Um, I mean, yes, dispersing the weight makes sense intuitively, um, but you're going to see that dispersal of weight and that take up across organization um, only if it really is clear that this is something the council really is pushing. Um, and we're beginning to see a little bit of uh, emphasis around WPS. You know, there are six or seven delegations that keep coming back and saying, no, this really matters. It's not out on this is core to what we're doing and take it seriously. Um, but we, we haven't seen it in the same way on POC. And just one small demonstration of that, we, we had defense ministers discussing WPS on the 20th anniversary at their last meeting and, and we kind of missed POC in terms of giving it a, a solid political hit. And, and that's an opportunity that, that's lost. Um, part of this though comes down to resources. Um, and I can't speak to the resources across the various J units, um, but within the IS, uh, you know, Tori mm -hmm. ran through, or Marla rather ran through the uh, responsibilities for, for the, that are handled by the unit that um, Marriott used to run. Um, and when you look at that list of responsibilities and you compare it to the very, very, very small number of people who are carrying that load, it becomes very hard for them to make sure that they can be at every operational meeting at every place they need to be to, to keep putting the issue front and center in every discussion, every planning discussion about operations or whatever else you're talking about. So there's a resource piece to this, but there's a political weight piece to that. We try to fix the resource piece. It's a slow process. Um, the political weight piece will need to try harder. And, and frankly, Tory's project is, is a really helpful initiative in that regard in terms of just reminding people of the importance uh, of the POC element. Thank you, Ambassador, for inspiring all of us and for also reminding us the practical challenge of resources. I do think that uh, a few people have done an immense amount of work, uh, but hopefully there's more of us to help and support that. So thank you. Um, I think with that, we will close out uh, this discussion part, when I will turn it over to my fabulous colleague, Marla Keenan. Over to you, Marla. Great. Well, I am very conscious of time as the daughter of a retired um, army colonel. We were never allowed to go over time. So um, I know that we are just now hitting um, our time. And so if you do need to drop off, please do. I'm going to give three minutes really quickly um, as a bit of a recap and a pitch for tomorrow. So that was a fantastic kickoff to the conference. Um, having these four distinguished guests to hear from on the first day was really quite special. So thank you all so much for joining us and for sharing your experiences over the last several decades um, on how we got um, where we are today with POC. Um, even having worked on this for 15 years, that was a fascinating um, uh, for me to hear as well. So. Um, so as I was thinking about this conference, um, as Shakespeare wrote, you know, past is prologue, but what is to come is yours and my discharge. So what I really want all of us to think about um, is that today we were hearing about the 10,000 foot level, right? So views about the importance and the relevance of POC and what has been done to date. 
Now tomorrow and for the next few days of this conference, we're going to be asking that you all come um, ready to participate and think through what needs to happen in the future. Um, so today was more of a webinar style. In the next few days, it's gonna be much more interactive, much more time to ask questions. We're gonna keep the questions from today and inject those into um, the discussions over the next few days. So thank you for asking those. We really wanna get into the nuts and bolts of how we actually are going to protect civilians in future operations. Um, so we've asked our presenters to keep it short and sweet. It's about 10 minutes per presentation. Um, we know that all of you are experts. And so we want to be able to pull out of you through this these uh, discussions um, to better understand what the challenges are and then also challenge what has been presented and provide ideas and insight for the future. So we're looking forward to drawing out from all of you a broad set of gaps and opportunities that we see for the next few years for NATO um, implementation of the protection of civilians. So tomorrow we're gonna to hear from Joe Cups who um, on what uh, currently NATO doctrine touches on or um, has in support of POC. And then we're gonna hear from him and one of his colleagues, Robin Schroeder, about a project that they've recently finished on how Germany is implementing POC and how NATO policy doctrine and guidance has contributed to that effort. Uh, then we're gonna turn our attention um, to uh, Beatrice and Serhi from Center for Civilians in Conflict. Um, and our special guest, Colonel Nostrachov from the Ukrainian military. Um, and they're gonna talk a little bit about their work to implement protection of civilians in Ukraine's conflict. So it's bound to be a fascinating day and I hope you will join us. Uh, my colleagues are gonna drop the link to the registration uh, for tomorrow. If you haven't registered, you need to register for each day um, into the chat right now. If you have any questions, please do feel free um, to, to email any or all of us. Um, I, I think you have all of our emails at this point. Um, I think Tori, that's it for today. So if you don't have anything else, um, I'd like to once again, thank our speakers and wish you all a fantastic day. Thanks Marlon, everyone. Yep, absolutely. <laughs>